I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Meredith Peterson. Um, I'm a veterinarian and postdoc with the Swine Medicine Education Center at Iowa State. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on in conjunction with IPPA is um, gathering some resources on some swine health topics of interest, including ASF um, disinfectants and whether you should rotate your disinfectants, and then some specific pathogens. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, these distributions of these resources will start coming uh, this spring. So we will get started. Our first speaker today is Dr. Um, Jack Shear. So let's see, Dr. Jack Shear was appointed the Associate Administrator for USTA APHIS in August of 2019. He works in partnership with Administrator Kevin Shea and fellow Associate Administrators Dr. Mike Watson and Dr. Mark Davidson <clears throat> to carry out the agency's day-to-day -day operations. <clears throat> represent APHIS on a departmental level and cross-agency working groups and oversee activities of every APHIS program <clears throat> area and support unit on behalf of employees and stakeholders. In particular, Dr. Shear concentrates on emergency preparedness and planning as well as homeland and national security issues with a special focus on emergency emerging African swine fever. Dr. Shear received a Bachelor in Science in Biology and Chemistry <clears throat> a doctor of veterinary medicine, and a master of science and education with a minor in counseling, all from Iowa State University. He received his PhD in poultry science and microbiology from the University of Wisconsin. Thank you, Dr. Shear. Thank you, I'm gonna run through, I have 13 slides, I'm gonna to try to run through very quickly. Um, I won't be able to touch on everything, but hopefully we can hit things in a question and answer session. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So as many of you know, we, we diagnosed ASF in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. July 28th, we confirmed in the Dominican Republic and September 20th, uh, we, we were doing testing in Haiti also and, and confirmed it there. This was out of a program that we committed uh, way back in 2019. We started doing uh, regular, what I would call quarterly testing in the Dominican Republic as part of a project we were trying to develop for the Caribbean in regard to ASF so that we could start testing. We also had a twinning project or a project with the Dominican Republic Laboratory, uh, not on ASF, but on um, avian influenza, which put us in a good position to build, rebuild and build their lab and give them the supplies and the technology and the training that they needed to do ASF testing in their lab. Next slide, please. <laughs> The Dominican Republic, uh, what, we, what we started out doing was deploy, deploying uh, our employees uh, to help set up and increase the, their lab and testing capacity. And currently, they're at a place uh, with our assistance and our equipment where they can run their own uh, tests and diagnose African swine fever using the PCR and the, uh, the uh, antibody testing that we have trained them to do. Haiti is... a, a Whole different story. Haiti is a country in, in crisis. Uh, best we can do with them so far is to do diagnostic testing. They're sending us samples intermi intermittently, but based on the samples we've received, we have pretty much determined that almost all of Haiti is infected with African swine fever. The same goes for the Dominican Republic. Uh, as many of you know, we our secretary went to Congress and, and uh, ask for 500 million for ASF response that for DR in Haiti, but that is also, part of that is also for reinforcement of uh, the mainland, Puerto Rico, and the things that we need in if should African swine fever come to the United States. Our goal is early, early detection. We're working on systems of surveillance in the United States that will, will boost our ability to find this disease quickly because as we have witnessed in the Dominican Republic, any delay in finding this with the movement of pigs, it quickly spreads and it spreads rapidly. I would say that the Dominican Republic has moved and Haiti have moved from an emergency situation to an endemic situation at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the things that we're trying to put in place, uh, restrictions on imports, 
uh, good diagnostics, a, a strong surveillance plan, and response strategies. We're taking these same strategies and trying to work with the Dominican uh, Agriculture Ministry to put these in place and strengthen and develop their response as we work with them. Next slide, please. It's, it's key that in, in enhanced biosecurity and additional surveillance would help has has in the past helped us to mitigate any any spread of disease and therefore and mitigate the trade impacts and the economic impacts of this disease we have kept csf out of the united states from the dominican republic and haiti and they, since since the 1960s with our with our mitigation strategies and we're very confident that if we if we did nothing further we could we, we would still be able to prevent that introduction, but we are building our biosecurity and our surveillance, as well as other mitigation strategies to strengthen our ability to keep this disease out of the United States. That's why we're in the Dominican Republic. That's why we're working with Haiti. Next slide, please. So additional measures that were, are in place is we're working closely with CVB to increase flight inspections and, and border port types of activities. Uh, we wrote a federal order in, in August of 2021 that initially restricted all pork and pork products from uh, coming to the United States. Uh, excuse me, that was in, in December uh, or in August, excuse me. And then also for dogs from ASF countries, uh, certain requirements such as the bedding had to be treated, washed or, or destroyed. Uh, and then in December 2021, we revised that federal order for uh, Puerto Rico, which allowed movement of swine products and byproducts if they were from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands and created there and with stuff there. Live swine and germplasm shipments uh, were suspended, and, but we established surveillance processes and public education com campaigns that are ongoing in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Next slide, please. If ASF is confirmed in the U.S. mainland, we have several things in order. Um, we would work with federal, state, and tribal uh, governments and local emergency response uh, folks to trigger their plans. We have in place a 72-hour stop movement standstill, which many of you probably have heard of. Uh, shipments that were in transit would continue to be uh, shipped to their destination and, and processed there, such as slaughter establishments, but no new loads would be would be moved within that 72 hours. We'd allow time to implement basic control. Uh, that would allow us time to implement our basic control measures, establish control areas around infected areas, basically do the surveillance we need to find where the disease was and where the disease wasn't, and begin depopulation and disposal of infected swine. Next slide, please. Trade developments, we, we, we are in and have been in bilateral discussions to limit disruptions of trade. In March of 21, we developed a protocol with Canada to allow a bilateral trade should ASF be found in, feral, found in feral swine, but not present in domestic swine. We're also, uh, Canada also recognizes our OIE protection zone, which is in uh, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, we continue to work with Canada on zoning arrangements to uh, in regards to domestic swine, and we've agreed on commodities for safe trade in the event ASF detection uh, is found in the U.S. or Canada uh, for any, in regards to processed pet food or meat products, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, and we follow similar processes that are used in Canada, contacting trade, key trading partners to negotiate ahead of time uh, with in a, in a bilateral situation with countries like Mexico, China, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, so on. Um, and we continue to update and through those discussions what, what our trade uh, concerns and, and what we things we need to implement. Uh, when we wrote our protection zone plan, we contacted 22 of the major our major trading partners and reached out to them to say, you have questions, you have uh, you need explanation, please contact us. We'll, we'll be glad to sit down and talk with you about that. Next slide, please. 
can't stress this enough. It's we see it um, with every disease. The way we raise animals in the United States is for economy and and to to make to make money. And we put a lot of animals in the same place. We see the same thing in the poultry industry. Without biosecurity, all those animals are at risk. And what we stress in regard to this is the things that are on this slide: maintain strict visitor and traffic records. Um, for your personnel, your vehicles, your equipment on the farm, any any part of your production facility, um, draw that border around that barn that anything goes in there has to strictly be uh, free of disease and, and limited. Any visitors, uh, screening visitors are basically not allowing them into your, um, into your facilities, whether they're from an ASF affected country or any place that, and at least five days before they're allowed to, if they arrive in the country to, to visit your facility. Best method would be not to allow them in at all. Um, always review and reassess your biosecurity plans to make sure, and I would say audit them and your personnel to make sure they're following uh, what you have in place. Biosecurity can save you. We've seen it in many outbreaks where those that have biosecurity and good biosecurity don't get the disease. They make, make uh, money while the others uh, that get infected uh, are are strictly hampered and 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 lose lose money, and some even are forced out of business. Next slide, please. It's important to prevent uh, intermingling, of, and this is a basic thing of feral swine with domestic swine. Uh, that's just a key issue. We're we're battling uh, with feral swine in the in Puerto Rico right now, the trying to get rid of the Vietnamese pot, pot bellied pigs, where you have a, an eradication project going there. But trucks and truck washing, this is a big gap for the industry. We need to make sure that those trucks, when they come on and off the premises, have been washed, at least the undercarriage at the very, very minimum, and the tires. Next slide, please. This is basic. Uh, we. I think a lot of the signs of ASF look just like other diseases, high fever, appetite loss, depression, reddening of the skin, vomiting, and diarrhea, respiratory stress, abortions. In the early stages, and these, it's possible that there's different strains of this virus. Um, it's hard to differentiate from other diseases, and when and the milder forms of ASF are hard to tell in regards, and we're, that's what we're experiencing right now in the Dominican Republic, the, the more virulent strain that, that caused the classical cl clinical signs has more or less come and is, and, and is really not uh, as apparent. And now there are, um, there's a moderate to mild strain that's working through the pigs here. Uh, but anyway, if you see these signs, if you think at all that this looks different, death loss is higher, this looks different than your normal, what you're normally seeing. We want you to get in touch with your state veterinarian or your federal animal health officials and ask them to come out and, and to do, a, do, a, do some testing to make sure that, that, that you don't have ASF. We don't have near enough testing on farm uh, and we do rely on passive surveillance to get those numbers up and for producers to call us and let us know when they see these signs so that we can do a foreign animal disease investigation. Next slide, please. That's it for me. I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I'll be on for questions. Thank you, Dr. Shear. Uh, we'll follow up with questions after all three speakers have gone. So our next speaker um, bringing us a German perspective of ASF, we have Dr. Verena schutz schwark um, as well as Miss Judith Baumeister. Um, we'll have a video to play uh, from them, and then we'll have them come back for questions at the end. Um, Dr. Schutz Schwark is the head of Division for Livestock and Meat Production for the German Raytheon Association. Dr. Schutz Schwark represents the interests of German cooperatives in the meat sector, from breeding up to processing, towards the German and European politics. She, su she supports the 75 cooperatives in the meat and livestock division within research activities, communication activities, and market research. 
In 2003, Dr. Schwark received her degree in agricultural marketing and management from the University of Applied Science. She then went on to receive a master's in science in agriculture science in 2005 from the University of Kiel and a PhD in agriculture from the University of Bonn in 20, 2009. Thank you to give us the opportunity to present a short overview about the German African swine fever situation. The three key words and describe perfectly our activities before the first outbreak up to now, prevention, monitoring and animal disease control. In the next minutes, I will give you a short overview what we have done to prepare us for diseases and how we deal with it. When, when we talk about African swine fever, we should first take a look at the economic impact of the animal disease on the pig market in Germany. Due to the fact of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic situation in 2020 and African swine fever, the economic impact can be attributed to the two events. However, to the export restriction, ASF is a more lasting impact on the pig market. The market price could not recover and the production of slaughter pigs leads to daily losses for farmers. The average price for 1 kg slaughter weight was 1.40 in 2021. The price for slaughter pigs is currently 1.20. Pig farmers produce everyday losses for the moment 50 euros per slaughtering pig. The situation in the slaughterhouses is not better. Full warehouses, inhibited sales and lack of exports also lead to negative economics result there. What is the current situation of African swine fever in Germany? Since the first confirmed outbreak on the 10th of September 2020, up to now 3,216 cases of infected wild boars in four cases in domestic pigs confirmed. The biggest hotspots is along the German-Polish border to the fact of outbreak on the Polish side. Then two local events far from the hotspots are located, one in Saxonia near Dresden and one in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania. Two from four outbreaks in domestic pigs are on on backyard farms with simultaneous ASF activities in the wild boar population around. One outbreak was on one organic farm without free range. The source of entry is still open. The largest outbreak in a fattening facility is very likely caused by an inadequate hygiene. However, the quick action of the stock veterinarian lead to identify ISF in the facility quickly. The ASF events are in the eastern part of Germany located. We produce pigs in the affected areas, but most of the pig production is in the northwestern Germany. The districts Straw and Violet have the highest density of keep pigs. ASF in these regions would have even more catastrophic effects than the previous ones. If I talk about the African swine fever virus, I have one picture in my head. From a park dog sitting in a bag and the bag is stored in a moving train. The virus moves when he has to do it. It means a direct contact. It can be moved quite easily by vectors. Human is an important vector, and it has a persistent perseverance. That includes a good and a bad news. It is hard to eliminate the virus from the white boar population. But if you have a good practice of biosecurity, you can cut it away from kept an porcine animals. What have we done preventively so far? The most important measures to keep ASF out of pig houses is to comply with biosecurity measures. Germany has clear regulation for this. 
The pig keeping hygiene ordinance has to regulate this since 1999. This is regulated by specification for cleaning and disinfection, specification for structural measures, access restrictions and fencing, specification for operational processes, health management, specification for the transport of livestock and slaughtering animals. The specified measures are sufficient to keep the virus away from livestock, but this requires that they are implemented consistently. Farmers have to think about ways into the stable and ways out. Is there a contact necessary? Make a risk analysis. Record processes. Revise them to minimize contacts. Process awareness helps to identify risk factors and to eliminate them. Every farmer, every company has to do it for themselves and the individual situation. There are good practice available, but the process has to be done. The pictures are clear. It's an old story, but black and white areas are necessary. Here you can see easy but practical examples for cover feed silos with fences and safe cadaver boxes. Pork farmers have to have a health monitoring in cooperation with a veterinarian. In case of unusual number of death animals per farm, further tests have to be done in official laboratories. An autopsy will be formed on carcasses or samples. Regular checks with standardized checklists minimum twice a year by contracted veterinarian help to detect diseases and risk factors. In case of ASF pork farmers have to fulfill a monitoring before animal can be transported. Therefore, a lot of pork farmers do this blood samples to fill the monitoring requirements directly after the outbreak. This monitoring gives us a good overview about the situation on the pork farms in Germany. You don't have to understand German. The signs are clear. We call them the good practice of pork farming. Keep wild boars away from capped animals. Cleaning and disinfection. Change shoes and clothing. Store, feed safe. Clean your stable. Our federal ministry made draws to understand for everybody what is necessary for good practice. In 2018, different working groups start to develop ASF model crisis manuals. Experts with different scientific and practical background meet regularly and wrote the model. Currently, we modify these crisis manuals, the last one were done after the change in the EU animal health law. What does it mean, model crisis manuals? To transfer the legal requirements into a practical way, the model crisis manuals are made for farmers, transporters, consultants, feed suppliers and slaughterhouses. The manuals help to manage the event of an African swine fever outbreak by wild boar and capped porcine animals. A distinction is made between different scenarios. The legal requirements are prepared in step-by-step -step activities. Every farmer and company... In addition, we recommend training the staff in scenarios and rules of conduct, describing the processes to be followed in relation to the company situation and discussing and submitting this to, with the responsible authorities. In the worst case, all stakeholders have to know what is possible, what kind of additional measures should be fulfilled and how it works. For example, the employee and truck drivers should be trained in building up and use of the mobile disinfection system for trucks. Think about feasible solution and train them. You will not find solutions in the high-risk phase. 
One example to fulfill the hygiene rules for transporting services like for feed trucks. What kind of protecting clothing is necessary? How much do you need? How the truck drivers can be handled the process? The card show a solution from a cooperative company in Germany. African swine fever outbreak in the wild boar population lead to restricted zone 2. In all, we have three different restricted zones in the EU. By wild boar outbreaks, fences have to set up around the place of discovery. In this area, cadaver search and removal will be set up. And they started from outside to reduce the wild boar population. To save the market, farmers, transporters and slaughtering companies have to fulfill different requirements. It's not allowed to transport animals before testing or to fill constantly monitoring. Decision diagrams helps farmers, transporters and slaughterhouses to keep the legal requirements. This is one example of decision diagram. It takes time to create them and to bring them into agreement that private and public side will accept them in the crisis situation. Eradication of African swine fever in the wild boar population is difficult. Therefore, the number of wild boars should be reduced in Germany. Human is the most important vector spreading the diseases. Therefore, all wild boar, cadaver and road kills have to be tested in Germany. Hunters were trained to detect suspicion carcasses. In this case, they have to collect samples and bring them to official laboratories. The most important thing is to reduce the number of wild boars over the whole landscape. In the end, think about the picture of the packed dog. Please aware about your biosecurity. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask us. Thank you. We will circle back with the uh, German veterinarians after our final presenter. Our final presenter uh, brings a perspective from China. We have Dr. Keith Erlinson. Um, Dr. Erlinson received his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa in 2004. He has also earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science in 2000 and a Master's degree in Veterinary Microbiology, also from Iowa State. In 2011, he became a diplomat of the Board of Veterinary Practitioners in the Swine Health Management Specialty. In 2015, he earned a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of South Dakota. Dr. Erlinson has worked as a private swine consultant, staff veterinarian for a swine uh, production company, and a professional services veterinarian for a pharmaceutical company. For five years, he was the director of swine veterinary medicine for a top three pork producer in China. Dr. Erlinson joined Zoetis as a senior technical service veterinarian in 2020. Okay, um, thank you for the invitation to, to talk about African swine fever and my, my experience in China. Uh, in 2015, I took a job with one of the largest integrators in China to be the uh, director of their swine veterinary services. Um, of course, I thought I'd be dealing with uh, PED, uh, well, and pseudo rabies and classical swine fever. Um, and for the first three years, it was all about PERS and PED. Uh, then in August of 2018 in Liaoning province, the first case of African swine fever was reported. Um, the first case I experienced personally was a farm that was about six kilometers away as the crow flies from that original case. And African swine fever spread throughout China like wildfire. Within six months, basically the entire company in the entire country had reported cases. Um, when African swine fever was initially reported, we locked down all of our farms. And farms in China are a little bit different, um, especially the bigger farms. There's an outer perimeter, and within that is the actual farm itself, which is surrounded by another fence and a dormitory and a canteen. The workers live on farm 
for several weeks and then, then have a week or two of vacation and then come back. But day to day, nobody's really entering and leaving that farm. Uh, we shut down all those farms and, and limited access to only the essentials. Um, you know, anything we didn't need to bring in, we kept outside. Uh, if people didn't need to leave, they didn't leave. Uh, and still, we had breaks. Uh, the first case I saw, you, when I was in vet school, I thought you would walk into a farm and look and go, wow, that's African swine fever. Um, and it's been mentioned a couple times already, that's not how it works. Um, the first farm I went to, we, we cut open 20 dead sows. And I had a, a PhD pathologist with me who was working uh, on setting up our diagnostic laboratories. Uh, you know, he, he's taught at Plum Island. He's seen this over and over again. At the end of the day, uh, we were about 90% sure, but even after necropsying 20 sows, with all those gross lesions and the clinical signs, we still couldn't say, yeah, it's African swine fever. It was close enough, but it still could have been classical swine fever. It could have been something else. So the diagnostic testing component is incredibly important. Um, So in those six months from August to December of, of 2018, um, China moved from being an ASF negative country to, to basically an ASF endemic country. So in the beginning, if we got a case of ASF on a farm, we depopulated as quick as we could, started washing things, hoping we'd get it up and running. Uh, quickly became apparent that uh, that was not an economically feasible solution. Uh, so we started doing partial depopulations, or if you talk to people who've worked in China, the, they refer to it as a tooth extraction. Um, the tooth extraction method doesn't really work as well because in that they're only trying to remove the positives. Our philosophy was to go in um, where the positives were and depopulate a bubble of animals around them. And we found that, that doing that par partial depopulation scenario, we could be effective in about 70% of cases in eliminating the virus from the, from the farm if we found it early enough. And let me know when I'm out of time. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, partial depopulation seemed to work. Uh, the key to that is uh, regular surveillance of the farm and on-farm testing or testing that's very, very close and easily accessible. So what we wound up doing for most of our farms is any pig that died during the week, a sample from that pig was collected. And it's not a, not a difficult sample to collect. Basically, when a pig's infected with African swine fever, the virus is everywhere. You just need a, as a German colleague put it, you just need a spoonful of something. So every pig that died, we'd take a swab, we'd store those for a week, and then test them at the end of the week in our, in our low risk areas or, or areas of the country where we didn't think ASF was very active. In the high risk areas, we were testing every day with a benchtop PCR at the farm. Um, that allows you to find those cases very early, do a, a partial depop and hopefully save your farm. Now, saving the farm means we didn't have to do a complete depop, but Best case scenario, we'll probably depopulate about 20% of the sows on a farm. Worst case scenario, um, we've gone, we've actually lost half the sows on the farm before we got it under control. Um, so monitoring is incredibly important, especially in cases like we've seen uh, this past year with the, the PERS lineage 144C, uh, where you have that high mortality, especially in finishers. If guys are expecting high mortality, they go in and see high mortality, they're gonna attribute it to PERS and not really investigate any further. So the scary situation for me is for a, a, a foreign animal disease to get into a farm that's infected with another disease that's killing lots of pigs and nobody notices because that's what they're expecting. Vaccines, um, there were a lot of illegal vaccines used in China. Um, I've, I talked with my colleagues in China who know veterinarians who worked in those systems. Um, it never really turned out well. Uh, they were unregulated, untested vaccines, and 
uh, really what wound up happening in most of those cases is those farms, they just gave those farms a very mild form of African swine fever and, and wound up losing the whole herd anyway. Um, I know that USDA has made extensive progress on, on AS vaccine, ASF vaccines. Uh, my company, Zoetis, is also working on, on vaccines. Um, but in the, in the meantime, until we have a, one that's proven effective and, and especially one that is, is differentiable from um, wild infection, uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be able to rely on a vaccine to keep the disease out. We're going to have to keep the disease out and if it breaks and it becomes endemic, then we may, may start to use vaccines. Now that may change over the years, but, but right now um, don't depend on vaccines to, to bail us out of this. It's, it's a lot of biosecurity and a lot of hard work by especially our customs and border protection people keeping those, uh, those pork products out of the country. So um, some of my colleagues in the veterinary community are, are pessimistic about the ability to keep African swine fever out of the US. Um, I'm actually fairly, fairly optimistic. Um, as Dr. Shear mentioned in his presentation, uh, classical swine fever has been on Hispaniola for um, 60 years, and, and we've managed to, to keep it out of the US. Now, African swine fever tends to be a little more aggressive in its spread than, than classical swine fever from what I've seen, but um, you know, we've, got a, we've got a very good track record here in the US, in, and especially in our industry of, of coming together and, and getting things done when we really need to. So I'm, I'm optimistic for the future um, and, and really hope that I, uh, I don't have to deal with another outbreak of African swine fever in my career. So. There you are. Thank you, Dr. Erlinson. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the question and answer portion. We have several individuals um, uh, from the USDA, Germany, as well as our uh, contact from China, all here to answer questions. Um, I believe Dr. Jeff Kaizen is on um, the state vet for the state of Iowa. And then one other introduction is Dr. Rosemary Sifford. Uh, Dr. Sifford is the USDA Chief Veterinary Officer and APHIS Deputy Administrator for Veterinary Services. She began her career with the USDA as a Saul T. Wilson Scholar in 1997. Since that time, she has served APHIS in a variety of positions, crossing policy and operations in veterinary services, plant protection and quarantine, and animal care. She has served in the field in a variety of management positions, most recently as the Associate Deputy Administrator for Animal Care. Dr. Sifford received undergraduate degrees in animal science and agriculture business management from North Carolina, North Carolina State University and her DVM from NC State as well. So with that, um, we have a lot of uh, good, good resources in the room and, and via Zoom. Um, so we'll get started on our question and answer session. Just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Well, thanks everybody for your work. Um, so my question is, you know, besides, you know, wild and domestic pigs and soft ticks, is there any other um, animal or any other vector of transmission that we've seen uh, in, in our experiences in, in other countries? People. I mean, the, there's there's been research done, and and you know rodents can can at least be a mechanical vector. Um, I'm not real up to date on the research whether they can carry it internally, but um, you know wild boars, soft ticks in a, in a production setting, the biggest mover of African swine fever that that I've seen is is people, and that's people just making a bad decision, not getting something washed that should have been, not disinfecting something that should have been, doing a protocol incorrectly. That's, that's my major concern. What we're seeing in the Dominican Republic is the way they handle garbage. Garbage has, was probably the introductory source, and that's probably how they moved it to their pigs. And it continues to move through that source as they continue to have backyard garbage feeding. We saw both German veterinarians shaking their heads and nodding that people are also, so do you have some comments you want to add there? Yeah, humans are the important vectors. Uh, what we discussed quite hard, it's uh, hay, grass, and straw. 
because uh, of the harvesting situation, if you have less wild boars uh, laying in the fields, grabbing up the bones, bring them in the uh, field that we see as a vector. And uh, what I said, uh, we have one uh, outbreak in uh, uh, organic farm, and we don't know what's the uh, vector there. So we discussed uh, the human vector, but we couldn't confirm that. And maybe it's some animal, animal, uh, sorry, animals bring uh, bones into the uh, stable. So that's the only one situation. And uh, the big farm, um, there was a hunting situation behind. So they don't change clothing or whatever and uh, bring with that the uh, virus into the stable. So human is an important factor. Train the people and aware the people about this. Uh, this question is for the uh, German veterinarians. I think uh, one of the case uh, was ASF was reported in a commercial farm uh, where there's several thousand finisher pigs, and that was last year, I think. And did did you guys determine what was the vector there getting the virus in, into the farm? Uh, is that what I said? That, uh, uh, people working on the farm. Uh, they are hunters, and they were hunting before, and they didn't change the clothing. It's uh, incredible, and we couldn't believe that, but this was a mistake behind. So hunting situation, hunting wild boars. So what we tell our farmers is, please, do not go hunting. Do not go hunting for wild boars. Do not go hunting wild boars in the African swine fever uh, regions. And if you do this, please change the clothes and have black and white areas. That's an important thing. That was a, a case of outbreak, and there was, that was a single outbreak. They didn't shift uh, to another farm, and it's a closed system behind. The farmers have a south uh, on another stable, so that was a lucky situation. That was one big stable, and uh, then they bring the finishers to the slaughterhouse. And they had a lot of uh, death animals during two weeks, and they tested directly uh, to ASF. Uh, on China, I'm, I'm curious, after four years of ASF, um, curious what, what um, your current assessment is of ASF in, in China, and what your outlook is, are they on the right track? So I, I came back to the U.S. for the Chinese New Year in 2020 and got stuck here because of a, another disease outbreak. Um, <laughs> so I'm not terribly up to date on everything that's going on in China right now. Um, the, the small pig production, I think, is pretty much completely gone within China. Uh, the larger producers, are all have all started back up um, and and for the most part they have extensive biosecurity um, and 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 seem to be doing fine I mean there's there's still outbreaks but uh, the larger producers have, have learned to, to deal with the ASF and, and keep it out of those larger farms question regarding endemic situation so Keith, you'd probably describe that as China. Dr. Shear, you described Dominican Republic is headed towards endemic. Uh, my question is for Dr. Sifford and Dr. Shear, what is the timeline for any vaccine that might be helpful in an endemic situation? Well, I would say in the U.S., if we were trying to get it approved for the U.S., the minimum time frame would be about two years as we would work with the Center for Veterinary Biologics to get that approved. So there's work to be done in that the companies that are working on the vaccine strains have to prove safety and efficacy, potency. They have to do field trials. They have to get that all and provide all that data to the Center for Veterinary Biologics. Then they would enter into what would be a temporary licensure situation and, and, and where, where it be used in the field under limited um, cases and, and studied and then it would be licensed. So that would take time even if, if everything went well and all the data was done and the, and the extensive experimentation as far as testing the animals, the, 
and uh, that were given uh, the vaccine and, and to prove efficacy, that takes time. We always, CDB always tells us it's a two year minimum based on what they've seen with other companies that have tried to uh, get vaccines approved. I'll let Dr. Siffer see if she wants to add. If you could understand that time frame for the U.S., Jack, Dr. Shear, but is there any potential for expediting in the case of Dominican Republic? In other words, what you've described as endemic, could there be an, a way to expedite vaccine to the Dominican Republic, which would be more a safeguard for the U.S.? So I'm not asking about the use of vaccine in the U.S., but any provisions to expedite for a situation like Dominican Republic? Yeah, certainly it'd be up to the Dominican government if they wanted to expedite a uh, vaccine and, and put it into use. I think uh, we would hope that if that's a, a, an available thing and if it, if it was tried here that we could also use something like that in Haiti because Haiti's a more desperate situation. 80% um, of the farmers in Haiti are backyard farmers whereas only 20% are backyard in, in the Dominican Republic. And what was said about China and the big, big producers uh, being able to get back into uh, production, I think we'll see the same thing. So vaccination, certainly based on the government and approval on what the companies would, uh, and the government would want to do, that's really up to them. We would not have a say in that. Dr. Sifford, a reminder, you'll have to take yourself off mute if you want to add comments there. Uh, this this question is uh, directed to the USDA and APHIS. Um, I think uh, it's an understatement to say that feral pigs in U.S. is a uh, is a risk. And uh, I I'm I, I learned from other webinars sponsored by USDA and APHIS that there are six million in the U.S. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's as many feral pigs as we have sows. So I think it's a huge risk, and I'm wondering what. Uh, if you could share with me more and with us more details about what is being done to reduce the reduction of feral pigs in the U.S. and how much resistance uh, is occurring to reduce that reduction uh, or reduce the pig population. I'll start and then I'll let Dr. Sifford speak, but I would say that we've had a uh, with Wildlife Services, which is part of um, Animal Health Plant Inspection Service, has had a program for m many years, and that program is is directed at and in proportion. I think they have in the area of thirty million dollars that they use on in each of the states based on an eradication process uh, where they remove pigs. Now, the problem with the eradication process is is and what you see in many cases is the reproductive potential of these animals. You can take a lot of them out and the other, they're still out there reproducing. But Wildlife Services has been at this for some time. Um, resistance wise, I, I don't have an ex one of our Wildlife Services experts on, but um, yeah, there's resistance from owners that want to hunt these animals. There's resistance from owners that don't want you on their property to remove the animals. So we have, to, and, and, and even in, sometimes in the, in the state uh, parks and, and um, federal parks, uh, they, they, they uh, at, some want you in there to remove them and some don't want you in there disturbing the, the, lo, the other flora and fauna. So we run into those kinds of situations and, and at times it's a negotiation process, but all in all, I would say that uh, these pigs are very destructive uh, for both for crops and for uh, homelands and, and even people that have gardens. So I think there's a general recognition that they need to be reduced and removed. And our wildlife services is, is it's a constant program for us. Uh, Rosemary, do you want to add anything? I have a question um, for those who've experienced um, ASF on farms in other countries. What are the steps uh, that the farm kind of needs to go through in your particular country to regain um, negative status? And then once that's achieved, how likely is the farm to rebreak in your experience? 
so in, in my experience, we didn't really have an, a, an official uh, uh, designation, but uh, we would generally do, we would require two whole herd tests to be completely negative and those, those tests to be two weeks apart. Uh, and then we would say we were negative. Um, if a farm broke once, it's at a much higher risk to break again. So um, location, location has a lot to do with, with farms that break and, and farms that, that seem to stay safe. Um, comments from Germany on that? You got, may not have multiple commercial farms, right, to have lived through cycles of rebreaking or not, but some comments on, on that? Yeah, so we have a clear legal requirements on this. Um, if you're in the wild boar situation, um, commercial farms have to test regularly, like in a monitoring system by blood tests, uh, and then they are allowed to uh, shift the animals for slaughtering, for example. And if you have an AFS outbreak on a commercial farm, um, every uh, pig will kill. Killed. Um, then they have to look around all farms in a circle of three kilometers by blood tests. Uh, and then they have a stand still over 30 days. And uh, then you can maybe shift the animals. Uh, uh, and it's difficult because uh, if you are in this area of uh, then we call them restricted zone three, um, it's quite hard to, to transport these animals from one farm to another uh, farm or to a slaughtering place. And uh, you can slaughter these animals, but then they can't have uh, the normal stamp for uh, meat on that and it's not allowed to export the meat and it's not allowed to shift the meat in a, uh, between the European countries. So it's quite strict uh, described in the EU law and in our national law. How many days before shipping those animals to slaughter do you have to do the testing? Uh, maybe uh, Mrs. Baumeister will answer. She's my confirmed, and that's because she's working on a slaughtering place. Uh, minimum 15 days you have to do this. Uh, so you have to uh, check and blood test it and clinical test it your pigs 15 days before you can. Um, before you can transport the pigs to the slaughterhouse. And then you have to have a uh, veterinarian certificate by an official veterinarian, and you have tests, uh, I think, 24 hours before uh, transporting, and then you can shift only the uh, pigs to the slaughtering place. And this law is uh, for all EU countries the same. Yes, 24 hours before the transport, you have to do the clinical tests. They have to be negative and the blood tests, and then you will uh, um, become or, I, or get the um, veterinary certificate so you can slaughter the pigs. Uh, thanks for the presentation this morning. I'm just curious, particularly our veterinarians from Germany, uh, the discussion was that you had a, a commercial scale operation I assume was depopulated. I'm curious if you're having issues with your capacity to depopulate rapidly or can you talk just briefly about what procedures you take for depopulation? Uh, just I have one question if I understand right. You the uh, you are African swine fever on a commercial farm or African swine fever on a wild boar situation? Well, e either one, either on your small holdings, I assume you use different techniques than you would on a larger farm. I'm just curious about what's proven to be effective and uh, uh, rapid. Uh, so, 
Um, I don't know if you the you know the structure of uh, pork processing in uh, in Germany. We have some very small backyard farms, especially in eastern part of Germany. They kept uh, one or two pigs, uh, and these we don't call them really farms. It's uh, private uh, uh, meat processors. Uh, they have problems with uh, biosecurity, uh, but in uh, this few, uh, we have programs that they get money uh, and then we call these animals and that they are not allowed to uh, store animals for two years. And uh, I think uh, in Romania and Bulgaria, they do the same in Poland as well. Polish people do this as well. Uh, and the big commercial farms, uh, and if I talk about big commercial farms, it may, means a normal, standard, uh, stable 500 pigs and more. And uh, then you have the high biosecurity measurements and um, depopulation of uh, an outbreak. Uh, then we have to kill the animals and we have um, yeah, commercial companies behind that, uh, they do the uh, depopulation. Andres, is that your question or I'm completely uh, wrong what you mean? I think that answered the question. Yep, he's nodding. <laughs>